So welcome to our platform series with Andre and Julian. In our last video, we talked about how you can move from a product to a platform business by connecting your customer. And in our, this video, we will talk about the third method. So let's jump straight into it. What will be a third way to move from a product to a platform business? Uh, this particular method works for typically for B2B companies or businesses. And the idea is your company has customers and your customers have their own customers. So you're selling to your customers and then your customers sell something else to their customers. Um, and you can become a platform by reaching out to your customers' customers and offering them something that enhances the value of the service or the product that you're offering to your customers. So I know this sounds like a mouthful, but with the diagram, which is associated, I think this will make this this makes it a lot clearer. What are some examples of companies that are using this method? So one of the most famous would be OpenTable, right? Um, OpenTable offered a software to restaurants, which allowed them to handle their bookings, right? Manage their bookings. Uh, and that's what they started off doing. Um, you know, very nice software package that restaurants found very useful to handle the, you know, the reservations. Um, but after building up that business and getting a lot of restaurants on board, all those restaurants have customers, right? The diners. And OpenTable saw an opportunity to, to you know, connect the restaurants and the diners by offering a way of booking online with those restaurants. So they already had all the restaurants there. Um, the restaurants were handling their reservations previously directly, maybe over the phone, right? Or they might've had their own website. And then what OpenTable was able to do is to create this um, website where everyone would come to OpenTable and then they could see all the restaurants that were, you know, part of OpenTable and book through them, thereby, you know, creating a much more convenient booking system because they go to one destination and they can see all the restaurants and just pick the one they want and reserve it. The critical um, evolution or the critical change was the following. So they were selling the, the, the point of sale reservation systems to restaurants, which means restaurants had to get their own customers, figure out how to get their own customers. So what Julian mentioned, when, they, when OpenTable created the marketplace, the, uh, the, the website where diners could go and find restaurants and book, that actually made it possible for, uh, for restaurants to actually draw customers, like for OpenTable to help the restaurants draw new customers. And of course, for customers to search and uh, and discover other restaurants through OpenTable. So it basically creates value. It makes the, the interaction between restaurants and their diners um, easier. This this model has been, I think, used in you know across the world now. So for instance, in Singapore, we have a company, Chope, which is quite strong in Southeast Asia. Exactly the same model. I mean, we don't use open table here, but they used exactly the same model. They offered the, you know, started with the reservation system as a software for the businesses, for the restaurants, and then later created that website where everyone came to. And now, you know, if I want to go to a restaurant, I just go and choke. I can discover you know, special offers, and then they just book straight away from the Choke website. So this sounds yeah. a little bit like they already want, they, they wanted to be a marketplace, but then they were just onboarding one site first before they become the other one, uh, to, uh, and before they have the other site, right? Yeah. What it's, is, a, it's an interesting question whether they knew this usually, right from the start. They had this yeah. strategy and they're very, you know, they're very uh, sophisticated. Or they just started selling the software and then at some point they realized, look, this is a great opportunity to create a marketplace. Yeah. What is another example? Uh, let's talk about Indigo Agriculture, which is a company that offers, they, they sell to farmers seed treatments that help, help improve their crop performance. So they started, I think it was in 2014 or something like that. Um, they, you know, they grew quite, quite nicely. So their customers were farmers. And at some point, I don't know, around 2018, 2019, they created a marketplace where now the farmers uh, could sell their crop to their end customers. So the farmers are already selling crops to end customers, but what Indiegogo did, they actually made it easier for their customers to reach their own customers. So at this point, so at this point, the marketplace makes it a lot easier for farmers to reach specialized buyers who may actually not, you know, may not know all the, the different varieties of seeds that are being offered. And Indigo is in good position because obviously they work with their customers. There's lots of variety in the farmers that they, they supply. So they're in a good position to create this marketplace that allows end customers find the, the seeds uh, that they want. And one of the special features that enabled them to do this is, you know, because they supplied the seeds, they know, you know, they know a lot more about the crops, right? They know... Uh, and, and they track that actually. Yeah. So they have a tracking system. And so when the buyers come in, they know exactly what they're getting um, for the, you know, the, from the farmer's crops. 
and I and I think they raised two hundred and fifty million to create the uh, digital marketplace. Yeah. I think uh, for the seeds. Um, right. The other they were, observation. They were ranked that, as one of the most. I think two thousand nineteen or two thousand twenty one of the most disruptive companies in the world. I mean, another insight that I realized also with a lot of marketplace, one of the key building block is really the cataloging of uh, all the product and categories. I mean, like I said, I have a company with a little platform business. The ability to organize all the disparate information in some way so that, you know, in the marketplace for, for a finer buyer, you know, who comes, you know, you have everything and they're able to buy it. So as you say, Indigo, they already have all this understanding of the seed, which is essentially basically the final product and the, mark, and, and the cataloging of the different variety and types, isn't it? Exactly. Can right. So that's the, beauty, that's the beauty of this method, right? I mean, the, the, the whole idea is that you're leveraging your customer base. So the customers that you already know, what you learn from your customers to basically, like you described, Josephine, like to have like a, some sort of database or marketplace where I can catalog them and it makes it easier for their end customers to find the, 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 so the if, if you take that idea, So if you take that idea back to OpenTable, like it works perfectly. They knew at any point, because they were running the reservation system as a software for the restaurants, they knew at any point in time exactly how many seats are taken, what's available. They have all that in their system already. So now when they create this marketplace, they can immediately handle all the you know, inventory issues, right? Like making sure that they know when the restaurant's full, when it's open, they can discount the prices. They can allow the restaurant to discount the prices when they have a lot of empty seats. So they have, they have that cataloging built into their system. And of course, they can also recommend, like let's say you're, the restaurant you're looking for, it's full, they can now recommend uh, restaurants in the area that are related or that, 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 that have open seats. Like a substitute product. Yeah. Okay. Teachable? Uh, teachable. So Teachable is, again, a software uh, that allows instructors to develop their courses, right? So it has all the software that you might need to, to run your own course. And these instructors, you know, originally they were running their courses, they're finding their customers, um, they're doing all the marketing themselves, and they're just using Teachable as a way to, you know, to, to actually construct the course, right? But they have their own websites. And then at some point, Teachable again saw this opportunity. Well, you know, our instructors, we actually have a lot of them. They had like 100,000 instructors. They're teaching a lot of different students. So that's the customer's customer. Um, can we find a way to help them reach those students, you know, more easily, help them with the marketing side, right? Connect these two groups. Uh, and they've done that to some extent. So they have a discovery page where you can go and you can discover courses, right? Um, they don't have a full-on marketplace um, where you can like compare different instructors and compare their rankings and, you know, their prices and choose, but they're helping somewhat with the discovery by allowing the instructors to pay to be essentially on a page where they get more profile. I am one of those uh, customer of theirs in the sense that I actually use a competing product called Pinkific. And interestingly enough, for my personal experience, I was just using it basically to put all my content together in the course, not marketing it. But I can see how they are offering a lot of, um, they actually recently launched their app, which is your first method. They actually recently launched a Pinkific app store that allows all the um, uh, you know, marketing campaigns, Zoom integration, all payments, you know, and all for people like us, you know, to want to market and sell and you know, automate all the whole processes uh, for the instructor or cost creator. Um, they have not have a marketplace yet, um, but, um, but they definitely sell me tools that are you know, sales and marketing related to help me obviously sell and market my course in terms of affiliate marketing and everything. Yeah, so that's definitely more of the first method, right? They're, um, they potentially could have a, something like a marketplace for these third-party providers to provide you with tools, right? And in contrast, this third method that we're talking about um, now is, would involve them creating a website where you know, students would go to discover courses like yours. Yeah. Right? Uh, what are some signs of a company that they can actually use this method? I mean, just like the previous me two methods that we discussed in the previous two, uh, two episodes, the first precondition is that your product has to have a sufficiently large customer base. So the product has to be sufficiently mature, you have enough customers such that it actually makes sense to create a marketplace or a platform or you're connecting your customers with, with their own customers. So that's that's number that, that's that's the first thing, the most basic one. Even maybe even more basic, um, just to point out, I think Andre already mentioned it. I mean they have to be business customers, right? Um, so your first customer base has to be looking to sell something or, you know, in some way reach out to customers. I guess they don't have to be full-on businesses. 
they could be creators or you know just individuals that are producing stuff but there has to be something that they want to sell or something they want some some content they want to get subscriptions to or something like that in order for you to see an opportunity to create a marketplace, these customers of yours, so the businesses or the small creators, they have to have a need, right? Like a need for basically better interacting with their customers or for reaching more customers so that you can help them with that. If they're like, let's say if there are very large businesses that, you know, they're, they, they already have the, everything set out, it's very like, there's not much you can do like with a marketplace or a platform that would help them. Right. If you think about the restaurant, you know, they obviously have a need to get more diners in, right? If they were always, if it was a restaurant that was always full, you know, had a line outside every day, there's no need to use open table to reach more customers, right? Because they're full. So this is, but you know, that's not typically the case. Restaurants typically are looking for more customers. Instructors are typically looking for more teachers for their classes, you know, that, to, to fill the classes um, the farmers are looking for more customers for their crop so these are the these are the standard example and in fact so that, that to use a very um, I guess a very interesting example um, think of something like Shopify so Shopify is somewhere in the process in the middle of the process of doing what we what we're talking about so Shopify obviously is b2b so at, at its core it's a b2b software product typically for small companies or I guess some there's some medium-sized companies now that use it but typically for small companies to launch to launch their e-commerce websites and to basically run the run those websites so it's uh, it's infrastructure software infrastructure back-end software infrastructure that these e-commerce websites can use now now, shop, at least in principle, so Shopify, because these are there's lots of these customers, I think Shopify at this point has more than a million customers. Uh, they're typically small businesses. They always need more customers, right? They need to, you know, they can certainly find their own, but it's, it's difficult. They have to advertise you know, on Google, on Facebook, whatever have you. Certainly Shopify could help, right? So in principle, at least, Shopify could create a marketplace where their customers, so Shopify customers, could list their products and then uh, consumers could go to their website and uh, and find these Shopify uh, e-commerce stores. Now, this sounds great in theory. The problem is if you go down that route, then it becomes another version of Amazon, right? I mean, what I just described, it's like, well, I have a marketplace and there's lots of shops and consumers can find them. It looks exactly like Amazon. So I think this points, I mean, it's interesting, like shop, at least in principle, Shopify could do this, but I think it points to the fact that in some cases, there limitations and not everyone should rush into uh into using this method so in the case of shopify it should be pretty clear that they want to be quite different than amazon and if they went down the same path presumably their customers and small businesses might not like it right the reason they like shopify now is that it gives them independence i use shopify but shopify is not trying to control my customers the reason they don't like amazon well amazon has lots of consumers of course but the problem is well amazon controls the consumer so it controls the consumer side the buyer side so the small businesses may not like it so if shopify became like amazon it would greatly reduce its appeal but there there have been some ways in which shopify has moved towards being more of a platform in this third way right like connecting customers with their customers. So Andre, I mean, you're, you're sort of an expert on this. What, what specific ways have they? Yeah. So it's interesting. It's, it's a very rich example, right? Because so you can see the tension that basically based on what we just discussed, so they could do it. And I'm sure there's like some, presumably there's some push in the company to go a little bit down that route, but if they go all the way, just like the examples we mentioned, like teachable, uh, open table and in, indigo agriculture, again, it becomes like Amazon. They can't do that. But they can do certain things and they have something called uh it's called the shop app so it's basically it's a payment mostly a payment app which allows so let's see it allows their customers so it's something that allows payment functionality for for returning customers so it's like let's say i'm a consumer and i buy something at an e-commerce website which is powered by shopify so they're they're a customer of shopify if that customer uses the shop.app payment system from Shopify, it basically saves their information. So I've actually encountered this. So it saves my information. And the next time I go to another Shopify powered e-commerce website, it actually recognizes me. So now my checkout process is a lot faster. So they do provide something to consumers, i.e. the payment functionality, which makes it easier. So like when I go from one Shopify merchant to another, it just makes the process easier. But notice one thing that it doesn't really offer 
is the discoverability. So one of the key things in the previous cases, like say with OpenTable, the OpenTable platform or marketplace they created certainly allows consumers to browse restaurants and see like, okay, which restaurants have tables available? Which one do I want to go? Shopify does not have that. They have a payment functionality, but you have to know, like you have to already know the merchant you're going. So there's somewhere in between because again, they don't want to look like him. The other thing they did, isn't it, that they allowed customers to sort of have a bookmark of their favorite stores. So again, no discoverability. They're just making it easier for customers to come back and you know, repeat purchase from the stores they've already bought from. That's right. Um, yeah. So you know, now you basically all the things they're doing are just making it easier for the customers to work, you know, buy from these Shopify powered merchants. Yeah, and I think without, without there, offering any discoverability. Right. And the key there, right, is the exactly. I think that's think of it, I think it's useful to think of this from the perspective of the shop, the store, right? The the the, the little merchant. So the key is like to keep these merchants happy, right? So they love Shopify when it gives them back-end, back-end stuff. They love the shop that app and they love the ability that customers can bookmark so they can easier come back and repeat purchase and so on, right? If Shopify offered discoverability, you wouldn't like it, right? Because I get to, I work really hard to get customers to my e-commerce store and now you're making it easier for those customers to shop at my competitors. Like that's fundamentally the problem with this method, right? So this is why like this transition, so going from product to platform using this method, uh, reaching out to customers' customers is a bit fraught because your customers might resist it, right? Inherently by creating a platform, you're kind of like, there's an element of you're commoditizing your customers. So they don't really you, like it. You ask um, restaurants, right? How happy they are with open table and you'll get a good sense of the fact, you know, well, yes, it was great when it was just a software, Oh, right. But in the end, it's like they have to be on there to, to find customers because every you know all the other restaurants are on there and it's just commoditizing them with people just switching between all in the fact, restaurants it, to find the lowest in, price. In, in fact, it was probably great even at the beginning of the marketplace, right? Because at the yeah. beginning, it was like, oh, it's awesome. It brings me new, this marketplace a lot, like brings me new consumers, right? But once it becomes big and everyone goes to open table, including all the restaurants is there, then you're like, well, now it's what it's mostly doing is, is basically putting me in competition with all the other restaurants. And, and I would say like, you know, in the end, a lot of those customers who um, these restaurants get through open table, they would have got anyway. Right. These are people who That's are already right. going to go to that restaurant. They would have previously rung up or booked online. Now they book through open table. So the restaurant has to pay these fees to open table for every booking. And right. they would have gone there anyway. It's just because it's a little bit more convenient to go to open tables website and open table probably gives rewards or some kind of incentives for people to book through open table then they you know they, they'll go through open table and the restaurant ends up paying higher fees my recent example of using uber eats as well because it's like they only show you who what's around you but there is a specific asian malaysian place that i want to eat and get delivery from that is like 10 kilometers away right and i just cannot find them on the uber eats app you know from that for that reason because they don't discover they are showing you what are the, the one that they are promoting, basically, instead of the one that I want to go to? Uh, the, the average group of restaurants that want to be, you know, um, you know, get customers or the one that has really a brand equity and a following <laughs> that specifically people want to go to and buy from, right? In there, basically, so Uber Eats, obviously, is a two-sided platform. So it has yeah. this problem that there's this coverability and they control the customers. There are some companies in the space, which basically are the equivalent of, so do for restaurants what Shopify does for e-commerce. So there's some companies that just basically provide the software for restaurants, but they don't create a marketplace, right? So I'm sure like your like your Malaysian place, that's awesome, that has a great brand already. They would probably want to use this one, but not Uber Eats, right? They would probably be very happy to use the software from this one, but they keep control of the brand, they keep control of their customers, and they're not put on this marketplace with all the other restaurants, which essentially take, you know, kind of commoditizes their brand. And this, the software that you're talking about, Andre, would be, you know, would help them um, with the delivery. It might even actually link in or integrate with delivery companies, right? It's just that they're not controlling the customer. They're That's just right. providing the backend service for the restaurant. Yeah, I yeah. found that they have. So so this specific Malaysian restaurant have their own ordering website and delivery that they do that you order directly. From that example, go back to Shopify. Um, if I'm not wrong, they do allow, they, 
they they did allow they maybe still do allow some discoverability which um is what i think is the local discoverability right so i believe they had this uh, this proposal which they put into action during uh, covid period to allow people to discover uh, e-commerce sites in their neighborhood that were selling stuff that they could just pick up locally right? and this is kind of environmentally friendly it was you know consistent with you know the certain policies that they wanted to help sort of your local businesses who have customers in their neighborhood to reach out to those customers so there they were actually offering some discoverability but it minimizes right so the thing is like if it's in your neighborhood it minimizes the negative effect because there's probably not as many substitutes right like there's the chance that there's like a very close direct competitor in your neighborhood is probably not that high exactly so like if there's a print printer shop or something that's doing you know has an e-commerce website um they you know frame do the framing of your pictures or something like that and send it to you i mean if there's one that happens to be very nearby this that's probably the only one uh and in that sense they're not really putting a whole lot of competitors against each other by offering this kind of discovery they're just sort of allowing you to discover well who is actually in my neighborhood who does this thing that i want yeah i mean it would be interesting by the way it would be that might so we're talking about in today right but like don't hold us to it in the sense like it's possible that going forward there's going to be more and more discoverability by shopify it's interesting like up to now they've kind of flirted with it like very closely but they haven't really done it outright but who knows i mean it's possible going forward they might actually offer a lot more discovery you want to talk about substack yes sure yes an example we're, we're both very familiar with given our substack um platform chronicles uh, which we write um yeah so substack is you know it's just a software that uh helps writers um get their content out right so you think about newsletters and blogs and so on they basically provide a, a very nice software where when we when we want to publish our writing right it gives us a way to send that out to our distribution list to track uh you know how many people open the content and to you know if we want we can start charging for it it allows for that payment functionality and a bunch of other services right um but they don't really what they don't help us do is find new readers right suppose we were charging for our service you know then we obviously just want to get a lot more readers so we can get more revenue um we would like them in some way to be able to bring us in new readers right so that's something they don't currently do but obviously they have that opportunity right they could create a marketplace where all these different writers substack writers their newsletters were discoverable in one place and people could you know choose between them maybe even get rankings which are the more popular ones less popular and uh you know they could have different prices up there and people could choose and discover that way that's not something they currently offer but obviously they could so what is specifically about the signs of them the characteristic of them that make them you know uh good to use this method well they they do have a lot of writers right so if you think about our criteria they They have a lot of writers who have an interest in reaching have a need for reaching more readers right so lots of users lots of customers and those customers are looking for more customers of their own right so that meets those criteria uh, and if they had some way to do that um that would be very attractive on the one hand right like now we have a way to get more readers on the other hand we might start to worry well once they create that marketplace then you know people will some of our readers may discover that there's some other content out there that that they prefer and they switch right uh and it basically puts all the content writers onto one page where they're competing so it's making us more commoditized if you like so this is isn't this the difference between writing on substack as well as um and versus writing uh, uh, on medium because i think in my understanding exactly. is that medium is where you want to be discovered um and therefore increase your exposure and to be known and find a following and then also at the same time be paid for it when it's viewed substack for me is i feel is uh, for people who have a following it's quite clear that they could have a following and they are bringing them to substack so that they can actually monetize or you know create you know deepen the relationship exactly so what are some of the potential pitfalls and trade off of of this method and also for this example So actually let's to to finish on Substack because I think it's closely related right so yeah. just like we said with Shopify the big concern right so comparison with Medium is 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 good here so with Medium yeah we, so actually we considered platform chronicles on Medium versus yeah. Substack so the issue with Medium is well you're competing with everyone else 
and you don't really have a lot of control over your readership, right? On the other hand, yeah, they will actually work harder than Substack to bring your readers versus on Substack, we're on our own, but we have complete control of our readership, right? So it's a bit, it's the same concern that say Shopify merchants might have, right? They like Shopify because it gives them full control. I mean, Shopify doesn't really help them reach new customers, but at least it, allow, it allows them to fully control those customers. Now, in terms of, so back to your question. So in terms of what are the pitfalls from the from, from the platform perspective, from the company who's who's considering this transition? Well, this is the main one, right? So yes, I mean, you're, right now you have a product, your customers love you. The moment you try to reach out to your customers' customers, your customers might just hate it, right? So you have to find that this is like why we, we, I think it's interesting that we talk about all these examples. There's a very fine line between reaching to your customers customers in a way that pisses your customers off because they feel like they're being commoditized or what are you doing like you're taking my customers away versus doing doing so in a way that makes them feel oh you're actually helping me like you know enhance the relationship with my customers so that's why what shopify is doing is interesting because it's kind of like a, an interesting dance right where like they're we're just trying to like help their customers deepen their relationships with their own customers but if they went too far, they would be like, what are you doing? Like, you're just becoming another Amazon that's commoditizing us. You can imagine the large Substack writers, which have a big following. You know, if Substack starts putting them onto their main page with everyone else and not necessarily putting them at the top, right? Because they yeah. want to drive people to someone else where they're making more money. They're not going to be happy, right? They're going to take their business off Substack and go to some other service. So that That's is, right. you know, that is the big risk of going this way. And the same thing would happen with Shopify. Right? They may lose quite a lot of their large, uh, larger, um, you know, e-commerce sellers who may go to competitors, right? They can go to big commerce, WooCommerce, and so on. There is another one that's worthwhile to consider, and I think uh, the Substack example works really well. So right now, because Substack is just a backend software tool, they're not really responsible. So think about it, like th there's always this issue of like. like like who's responsible for objection, let's call it objectionable content. So right now, if I'm, let's say Julian and I decide to like to write a post like full of objectionable content, well, it's our problem, right? I mean, of course, there's certain things that Substack would just simply forbid. So if we're to put like, uh, yeah, whatever, <laughs> they're going to, they're going to forbid. But by and large, because they're just backend software tool, the responsibility falls on us. The moment Substack, so assume if Substack were to do what we just described, which is to become a full-on platform like Medium, now you actually have to take responsibility. So the, there's a key difference between Medium and Substack is like Medium, because they're recommending content to users, they actually have a lot more liability in terms of what content gets published. You have to be really careful. Substack actually got, so some people, I know they objected to some sub, to some like uh, some of the newsletters on Substack, but they can credibly say, listen, we're just like a backend platform. Like you, there, there's no way to, to hold us responsible because we're not the ones recommending to users what they should read. It's basically like it's, you know, it's the, it's the content provider. So I think that's another one that's very important. So again, you become a platform now, you're, you're kind of responsible. What is the benefit of this specific method? Maybe if there is anything that come out from it, rather than just trying, okay, it's good to move a product from platform. Is there anything specific that is the benefit of this specific method? I think fundamentally it does come, I mean, and I think that's good actually, like it does, even though the methods are different, fundamentally it, the benefits, it's, it's always the same benefits. It's more defensibility, uh, network effects, uh, potentially new revenue streams, but they obviously they manifest, the, they manifest themselves differently with these three different methods. And certainly the pitfalls are somewhat different. I think for this specific method, I feel that it's like if you connect more your customer's customer to your customer, so it's more like a throughput kind of thing, right? The more that get connected, the more you sell to your customer. That's the whole idea. <laughs> I, think there's, I think there's one other uh, benefit here, which is different from the others, perhaps, which is... Um, you're previously, you're take the case of open table, right? You're just dealing with restaurants. Those are your only customers. Now, when you provide this way for their customers to buy from restaurants, you have a whole new set of customers that you're, 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 you know, that you're selling something to, which is, you know, coming to my website to discover restaurants. So potentially now I've, suddenly got this whole new set of customers, which can be much larger than the original set, um, which I could sell other stuff to, right? If they wanted to go into other, you know, into other businesses using those customers. So they build up this huge customer base from their customers, and that gives them potential to, to you know, to create something else selling to those customers. We haven't, I don't think we've seen examples of that, where they've really leveraged that. Um, but that is certainly something that's a bit different from the others, like, you know, 
the second method where you're connecting your customers, they're already your customers, right? Right. So there's not, not like you're getting a new set of customers that you could sell something to. I mean, the first one, you do bring new customers, but I think what's different here, uh, so it's like here, in some sense, you're like, you're clearly multiplying like the, the number of customers you have. And the first one, yeah, you're just adding some more customers, the third parties, but it doesn't have this multiplicative effect that it has with this with this method. Because B2B, your you know, your businesses, whether it's instructors, restaurants, right, or farmers, the number of their customers is far greater, right? Because each of them has many customers. So you're multiplying you know, for each of your customers, you're getting 100 new customers. Um, yeah. Of course, they're a different type of customer, they're consumers, not the producer. But, you know, potentially that gives you uh, a much bigger customer base to in the future to I, it, I think it looks like a very obvious when you say it's suitable for B2B software too. Is, is this when the product to platform is like B2B to C and that's where the extension yeah. goes. You know what I mean? Yeah. B2B yeah. B2 to C and that's where yeah. even most, well, most platform companies are B2B to C. Okay, so I have a product example and I'm going to test you to see if you can flip it into a platform in 30 seconds or less. So Andre, Julian, you're going to you're gonna time him. <laughs> basically right so mine is actually a client that i have and uh what they do is that they are actually a distributor for solar panels for solar panels and obviously all the batteries and rackings and everything so what would what can they do to be a platform go all right so i think this is a very straightforward one so the first thing is right now they're a distributor which means presumably they buy the solar panels from the producers and then they resell them to retailers right so it's like a to b to b so yeah the first thing they could do is obviously instead of them taking the whole like inventory risk they could connect some of the suppliers with the retail customers so create a marketplace that way the second thing that they could add on top of that so i'm just going to rattle off a few ideas yeah. i'm not saying all of them make sense but it's yeah. certainly a lot of these I and mean, maybe some of these will, will be workable the second thing you can think about like the main business is solar panels like you buy solar panels but there's probably some adjacent products and services to solar panels so when I buy a solar panel, what else do I need? Well, presumably, for example, at least at the very least, I need someone to install it. So, I mean, I guess they're selling to retailers, but what they could do is connect the retailers with suppliers of parts or services that are complementary to, uh, to the purchase and installation of solar panels. Now, I'm not an expert, so I, can't, I, I don't know what those parts and services are, but I'm sure there's quite a few. And it probably doesn't make sense for this particular company to supply all of that themselves but they could create a marketplace around its main business that allows third parties to, to supply those. Okay. And then if they're selling to, just to link it to what we were just talking today, so if they're selling to retailers, and of course the re retailers are selling to consumers, well, obviously you can use this method and maybe reach out to consumers and say, fine, for example, find the retailer closest to you that has a particular brand, that carries a particular brand of solar panel or that can, can help you install this particular solar panel. Yeah, so basically you have used all the three methods that we talk about, right? You know, through this process. I haven't used the second one. I mean, but you know, I haven't used the connecting That's customers true. yet, uh, but That's I'm right. sure we can. Yeah, I mean, you know, yeah, you can't really connect the customers well because again, their, their customers are actually competing with each other all the retailers, the retailers are all competing. Yeah. 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 So that's the one of the things. Yeah. So that's well, what you can't work. You can you could allow them to uh you know to collude on price on the price of <laughs> solar panels. And go to jail. That's a good one. <laughs> yes. But, um yeah, so actually it's installed. That made me think of another thing. Presumably you can also get people to like there's probably different configurations and you can get people to like to create a website where people say this is the configuration i use this is how it works you can get experts for example to say like for this type of house this is the configuration you want so this can ah. be provided by by third parties All right like sharing how how household has done it and what is the experience what should they look out for if this is my house like that you know this so that is I that is more like the second method although it's sort of their customers customers but it applies to their customers customers yeah, yeah. So yeah. like a combination of <laughs> yes yeah. that would be like the retailer yeah connecting their customers which is the both householder to share information experience of actually installing solar panels right like going that's right it. so they'll be good for the retailer it's a little harder to see but i guess it depends on the specifics but it's a little harder to see why the the solar panel distributor would get involved in this particular one because this seems like a much better fit for the retailer to do but maybe you know maybe they know something that the retailer doesn't and they can they can provide it for them yeah so actually it. a lot of times the product knowledge is and technicality is with the distributor because they do training to go. the retailer in order for the retailer to know the product enough to actually configure the final installation design so a lot of technical support come from the distributor on the product side itself 
to design the engineering design of the uh, solution. And right. they also have a, the catalog of and the knowledge of all the products in terms of the panel type, you know, the warranty, the type of racks and, you know, any engineering inverters and configurations that needs to be there. So it's a perfect sure win to be a platform for them. <laughs> I mean, it would require, so just to be clear, I mean, I, what I promised- It would require I, Andre to provide consulting services. <laughs> I think that's very obvious. I think I promised and I delivered. It's the, you know, coming up with ideas is easy. Like, you know, coming up with, uh, you know, reasonable reasonable ways for this, for any company to, to create a platform. I think it's worthwhile reiterating what we said at, at, up front for all of these. It's not necessarily the case that the answer is yes, we should become a platform. It's worthwhile to consider these and, you know, then look at these, like very, these options carefully and see what they would involve. But sometimes the answer is no. It's like, no, we're, happy being a product we're doing just fine and that's okay yeah. uh, but you know yeah. some of these scenarios might turn out to be like really valuable some companies have found this to be very very yeah i think it also uh get the company to clarify themselves right why are they doing why not you know is it in alignment with you know the core strategy is it alignment in you know that's what we want to be as you said you know in the position in the market like amazon they clearly are suitable for certain type of products and merchant and Shopify is obviously trying to attract a certain type of merchant and therefore aligning the strategy to it from that perspective right so that's when as a merchant you know whoever is dealing with all this platform it's probably good to know for them as well because they then also clarify which is more suitable uh, as a platform or product uh, vendor to use in terms of like in alignment with where they want to be. Yeah. be. Let's come to the fun question. So what is the most exciting emerging platform businesses that you are currently seeing and why is it so exciting for you? So many to choose from so little time. As angel investors, we see lots of interesting ones, but I think we can pick a couple. Maybe the first one that we really like these days, uh, especially because its valuation went up significantly, is OpenSea. So think of OpenSea as the eBay of NFTs. So where NFTs are non-fungible tokens. So it's this like new craze based on blockchain. So where you know there are all kinds of NFTs, some more uh, that make more sense than others. And OpenSea is basically the largest marketplace. Any more, Julian? Well, let me pick one that um, we we had somewhat divergent views on initially, but Andre's Andre's gradually coming around, um, which is Swimply, very funny name, but basically what they do is allow people to rent out their backyard swimming pools to strangers. Oh. Um, yeah, I think it, it's even moved into Australia now. It's really so big. Rent your, rent, your stra- rent, your, rent your swimming pool to a stranger. Yes. Compelling, right? I thought it's a compelling idea. Andre was not convinced. Um, but, you know, the idea is similar to Airbnb, but you know, you've got these swimming pools that are very underutilized. Correct. Yeah. And people living around that neighborhood who are like looking at very endlessly, like I'd love to get you know access to that swimming pool. And this marketplace is just enabling that, right? It's enabling people in the neighborhood or maybe even you know in the general area to come and see all the swimming pools in their area and the prices and, and book it by the hour. And you know, a lot you see a lot of the use cases would be, you know, I'm, I want to have a small party, you know, but I don't have a swimming pool, so let's go and use the neighbors, given that they want to make some extra money. Turns out that uh, actually some of, the, some of the owners who put their swimming pools on there are making a lot of money, like, oh. you know, like Airbnb type money, oh, just wow. renting swimming pools, yeah. just because, you know, there's, there's this huge demand for this. Right. Okay. I mean, of course, during COVID, you know, people were not wanting to go to public swimming pools. So this was great. But I think, you know, there is a sort of a long term, uh, you know, a long term um, sort of use case, which is just these are underutilized assets, yeah. which can be used for, you know, kids birthday party, uh, you know, or, or private get together where you want to have a private pool rather than just go to a public pool. Uh, okay. and, and I think that's, to me, it's quite obvious, but uh, Andre's got a different view. <laughs> so, like, I was skeptical. I mean, I convinced yes, I Andre, come, I convinced Yeah, I have, I have come around. So obviously, I mean, the obvious question here is like, how, I mean, I guess, of course, like the demand side is there. I mean, the obvious concern, but you can make the, the argument that Airbnb, when it first came around, it, it would have seemed equally crazy. It's like, who wants a stranger? Who wants strangers come into their That's swimming pool? Cool. Like, who wants strangers in their apartment? But of course, Airbnb proved this to be like a very workable model. So 
yeah, at least in principle, this could work. I would still put at at least like 15% the probability that this turns out to be a complete, completely ridiculous and people like five years from now will laugh at it. I hope that's not going to turn out to be the case. I guess the obvious difference from Airbnb is like Airbnb, initially that was the idea that strangers would come and rent a mattress in your house. But in practice, it's, you know, people are not normally in the house when you rent an Airbnb, yeah. right? Whereas here, people would normally be in the house when you're using their swimming pool. So I guess yeah. that's the part. It's a lot is... more exciting, a lot, which <laughs> makes it lots of, like, there's so many in exciting possibilities. Coming out in our next video, we're going to talk about whether you should be a marketplace or a reseller. If you know someone who needs to hear this, share this with them. Be sure to follow, subscribe, like, and send out your questions.